All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to welcome Alina Timofeeva, who is actually in Manchester today. How are you doing, Alina? Hi, hi, John. Thanks a lot. Thanks for inviting me. To be honest, it is very sunny in Manchester as well. I'm quite surprised. <laughs> oh, good. Yes. And Manchester obviously is in the United Kingdom. If anybody is wondering what Manchester, it's not Manchester, New Hampshire, it's Manchester in the UK. And Alina is a multi award winning female leader uh, in cloud di data, digital TEDx speaker, mentor, podcaster. And her, her TEDx uh, talk, Fail But Never Give Up, over 333,000 views already getting translated into, uh, into 30 languages and is the top, in the top 10 world's most watched TEDx speeches, which is unbelievable. That's fantastic. Well done, Alina. That's, a, that's quite an achievement. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's actually 355 now. <laughs> Oh, 255. You got to update your it grows, your, it your grows like three, five thousand, which is oh, good. Oh, it's awesome. It's fantastic. All right. So today we're going to talk about about failure, uh, which was the subject of your TEDx talk. But I thought we'd just start, start off by I'd like to get your definition of failure, if you like, because I think failure is such a loaded word and people kind of interpret it in, in, in many different ways, although it has the same meaning, it has a different connotation for different people. Yeah, I mean, for me, failure is when you want to do something, but you don't get the outcome you wanted to achieve. In my talk, I put a lot of arguments that failure is an opportunity to grow so instead of looking at it as, you know, I'm horrible, this is a setback, you actually see it as a way to develop, to become better. Um, yeah, no, I, I would agree. I mean, our, our biggest learnings often come. I, I had a, a colleague who had a friend and he had two, th he, he was a very successful businessman, but he had two things on his wall. He had his Harvard MBA and he had his first chapter 11 bankruptcy. And whenever any, he asked, whenever anybody asked him, which one did you learn more from? He always pointed to the chapter 11. Is he still bankrupt though? No, no, no. He's very successful, but he learned so much from that experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, something again, which I talk in my talk, but just broader throughout my whole life is specifically when I was perhaps in the misery or like, you know, in this lowest state where you feel, you know, how much worse can it get? That's kind of the time when you really develop or you really want to change something and you actually go and change something. And I recently went to a like masterclass of Tony Robbins and he was trying to advocate for a similar idea that, you know, it's in your lowest, lowest moment is when you actually start. I'm in so much pain, you know, mentally or physically that I have to change something and then it becomes a catalyst. Yeah, you know, that, that that's fascinating because, yeah, it often takes us to hit some rock bottom somewhere in order to make uh, real fundamental changes. So but not everybody, not everybody is equipped to do that. So how, how can people reorient their attitude to failure, if you like, and become and and be able to look at it and embrace it as a learning opportunity or an opportunity to change and grow? So for me, the biggest thing is the action, right? And people, they wait for some sort of a sign to do an action. And I guess from my perspective, I say, don't wait for inspiration. Don't wait, just take an action. Even step by step, you just go and you start doing something. That's the biggest thing for me, the power of action. I give some examples where, you know, I, for example, couldn't get promoted from washing floors to doing burgers in McDonald's, or I got declined by Fridays, which is like a burger chain of mm -hmm. being a waitress. And those are the funny failures, but to be honest, they did affect me because at that point in time, I didn't necessarily think it's very funny. I actually had to earn money and I was like without, a, let's say, a job. Um, but again, what I advocate, you know, you get a decline here, there, somewhere else, and you take an action and you get more, I guess, enthusiastic about this is the time when I need to get it. 
So, so just talk me to that for a moment. Like, okay, so you're working in McDonald's and you're washing or whatever, washing floors, and they won't promote yes. you to burgers. What? How did you? How did you end up like? I mean, number one, how how did you react to that initially, and then how did you react to it later? I mean, let me maybe tell a bit of a story for yeah, the uh, for the background. So when I was 16, I come from a fairly simple background. So I already went to uni at 16, but I started earning money. And what's interesting when you are under 18 in Russia, there are only limited number of firms who are willing to give you a job. So it's somebody like McDonald's or KFC, for example, but you can't get a job in like a proper restaurant because you're not 18. Mm -hmm. And McDonald's like a foreign company or like a corporate, right? They have this whole level system. So similar to corporates, they have like, I wouldn't say an analyst, but you know, you grow within your position sure. and then you become a manager, director and whatever else. And basically they hired me. I wasn't very talkative. In fact, I was completely non-talkative. They didn't give me the happy meal thing. They didn't give me the thing like, here you go, next customer, please. They gave me literally washing floors, washing toilets, washing like everything. And then I also did some fries, which is an argument of whether you can do both at the same time. But the thing is, the next step was the burgers, specifically Big Mac. And there were two exams. One was a verbal one and one was um, like one was a theoretical one and one was like a practical one. So the practical, you do the burger. The theoretical one, you do a test of how to do the burger. And the test is like how many uh, dots of sauce do you put on a burger? What are the calories? I don't know what sort of products are in it. Mm -hmm. So it's not outstandingly difficult, but, you know, unless you really think about how much you put on it and what you put on it. Uh, you have to make a choice and I made the wrong choice because I didn't choose the right answer. And then I was just told, you know, you're not made for burgers, say on fries and washing in the floors. And I was a bit disappointed because I really wanted to move up my career. <laughs> and you can find it funny, right? I mean, because it's a Korean burger business, perhaps. But at the time, I just wanted to do something different, right? So I wanted to see some sort of a progression, whether it's burgers or whatever it is. And I remember that that was a director of that McDonald's. So he sat with me in a very, very, very serious tone in his office. And he was like, Alina, I started not even with washing floors. I started by doing the night shift and carrying these sacks of everything, potatoes, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I moved up and it took me 10 years and I went from carrying all that heavy loading at night to being a director. And then one day you'll be a director. And then one day you're going to be like the director of several McDonald's in the area. And I was like, yeah, how long is that going to take? And he was like 10 years. And the reality is 10 years passed now. And I'm a director in a strategy firm, tier one firm in UK, in London. So obviously, I feel like it's a much better position than a director in McDonald's in Russia. Yeah, but I mean, I think the great point there, though, is, I mean, obviously, at a, at a formative stage of, of your life there, you know, that could have been a massive setback, right? I mean, that could have really sort of, sort of, you could have taken that on board and said, well, I, I'm only good enough for kind of low level jobs. And I think that's what happens to people. Sometimes they let other people set or they they think that other people have have a better idea of how good they are and set the agenda for their life going forward. And clearly you didn't take that on board. You went and said, OK, I, I need to find the next best step to move myself forward. Yeah, so I agree. But I think what is important is it's quite hard to get this change in your mindset and i didn't have it myself for quite a long mm -hmm. time so for example another example i say in my talk is how i moved to uk like i applied to 500 jobs and i got 497 declines and believe me however wonderful my you know personality is and the fact that i never give up it still hurts because 497 times does hurt <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I grew up in I grew up in Ireland during the terrible recessions of the of the eighties and that in the eighties and early nineties when everybody was when basically most of the country emigrated. Um, and yeah, it was more like applying for a thousand jobs and not getting any replies. <laughs> yeah, Which in my fine. case, it was always a reply like "thank you very much," but we have this <laughs> wonderful pile like 
all these candidates and unfortunately without no particular reason you're not the one and sometimes you know it's even harder obviously like in every job that you go like five interviews however many interviews and then in the last one you get to decline yeah so so talk me through then how you were how you were able to evolve and start to take uh to take not to take failure as failure but to take failure as an opportunity both to learn and to figure out the next steps forward i mean for me it started a little bit with misery i'd put it this way so for example with this jobs example everybody was telling me there is no way there is no way you're gonna get a job because you are an immigrant from Russia, you need the work permit, you know, you don't know anybody, it's far away, nobody waits for you in UK. Um, and, you know, it was very, very frustrating, right? So I just kept doing it and doing it. But the thing which really, ultimately, when I did get a job was again, the misery, because I worked in a big four in Russia. And I was finally auditing McDonald's, which was the same McDonald's, but now I was auditing and not washing forth. <laughs> and um, it was like minus 40 in Moscow. So I had to go, I wouldn't say by foot, like there was like a tube and a train and a bus and, and the walk, but it was quite miserable because I spent like one and a half hours commuting one way, one and a half the other way. I worked like 14 hours a day. I worked on weekends and it was just like too tiresome. And the money was really bad because it was like $500 a month, which is really bad. Um, so I just got so fed up that I was like, there was no way I can continue doing it. And once I was so tired that I came to McDonald's on Saturday and I figured out McDonald's is closed on Saturday. So I should have gone to the office and not to McDonald's. So I spent another three hours traveling to the office. Anyway, so... The biggest thing for me are two things. One is this misery which pushes you because, you know, perhaps you don't see an alternative. So you have to like there is an opportunity and mm -hmm. you take it and you take it because, you know, you don't really have 20 different examples or 20 different options at the time. But the second thing was more my personal experience. Like now I'm 30. Right. And these are not the only two times I failed. I kept failing in many different things. And essentially, it's more my personal experience that, you know, I failed, I failed, I failed, I didn't give up, and then something nice happened, right? And then again, I failed and failed in something else, and then again, something nice happened. So I'm kind of already resilient in a way that I know if there is something, you know, as a failure or somebody tells me something, if I look at it as a positive thing or as an opportunity, as I say, you know, something good will ultimately come out of it. I don't always know how long it's going to take. I don't know if it's going to be like, you know, one attempt or five, but ultimately something happens. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I look on life as a series of, I mean, you know, you go on a journey and you take a path and sometimes that path leads to a destination. Sometimes it just leads to a path, another path to somewhere else. And I think that's sometimes what uh, uh, the people the resilience part, I think, is really incredibly important because in some ways we live in a world where popular culture today sort of tells you that everything should be easy, that everything should come to you, that, you know, that it all should be instant. We're all about instant gratification. And that whole idea of resilience uh, is almost counterculture today. Yeah. So I guess from my perspective, for example, because I come from a poor background, I didn't have parents, I didn't really have anything. Right. For me, unfortunately, nobody came to me and said, Alina, we have this wonderful opportunity for you to go this, do this, do this, do this, do this. So I had to really, you know, go and find these opportunities. But in a way, it has helped me, you know, when I see an opportunity, I take it and, you know, ultimately I make it successful. If there is no opportunity, I create it. So it takes time, it takes resilience, it takes effort, but you know, I'm confident much more now than I was 10 years ago that, you know, I'm myself as a decision maker in my life, right? And even if there are all these circumstances of having no family, no money, et cetera, you can get out of it. Yeah, um, I like what you said about, you know, you're responsible, uh, you're, you're the responsible for your own life, you're directing your own life. I think that's the one of the hardest things for people to take on board, but it's one of the best and most liberating things is when you realize that you're personally accountable for your life. However, however that unfolds, I mean, things happen to people, but how you react, the, the situations you put yourself into, once you realize 
you are you you are responsible for all of this. Therefore, you can change it uh, and you can change your approach. I think that's the most liberating thing that uh, process you can go through. Yeah, and one of the things which I'm a bit a big advocate on is, you know, obviously you fail or even if you don't fail, you know, you do something, but it's this adaptation because it's very important to adapt and adapt fast if you can, because the quicker you adapt, the quicker, you know, you can figure out if it works or not, or if it doesn't work, you adapt again. Whereas I feel that sometimes I see that people, they keep doing, doing the same, 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 same thing. And then, well, I guess they get frustrated because nothing changes. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's I, I think that's what's hard for people is the fact that you have to make changes when things aren't going in the way that you would like. And some of those changes can be can be very difficult changes. For instance, I mean, maybe you need to surround yourself with a different set of people. Uh, maybe the people you're surrounded with today are not the people who pump you up and help you go forward. Maybe they hold you back. Maybe maybe you keep them in your life because they hold you back. So because um, psychologically that gives you an out clause. And I think there's there, you have to make some, some difficult choices at times. Yeah, I agree. So one of the things about myself is where I grew up, right? There were no, not so many opportunities. So for example, everybody in my family is a housewife, right? And they saw that being a housewife is the best thing which could possibly happen to me and to anyone else. And I didn't really have, you know, like an example of a role model or even, I mean, to be honest, I didn't see them on television. I didn't see them around. I didn't really see them anywhere, right? And, you know, as I started moving out of that circle, as I, well, came to UK, for example, I started seeing, you know, this different circle and kind of being part of it, or at least trying to be part of it. And that was something which really changed my mindset as well. Yeah. And I mean, I had the same kind of, well, similar, well not the same experience, but I mean, being an immigrant myself to the US, um, one of the things that really kind of blew my mind when I first got here was the fact about how many chances people will get like you can fail at something and somebody else will give you an opportunity in a way that uh, I had never seen before never seen before and so it really taught me is uh, as you pointed out is the fact is that there are that you can always find the opportunities if you're willing to do the hard work and if you're willing to look for them may mean that you have to move it may mean a lot of different things if you're prepared to do the things that will help you uh, be the best candidate or or do the best of the opportunity then then you have a chance of success but if you're not prepared to do those things if you start to put too many barriers or obstacles or criteria i have my set of criteria and if they don't meet this then i'm not going to move forward then all you're doing is sort of keeping yourself stuck yeah i i agree and to be honest what i'm doing at the moment because i'm very passionate about all the immigrant journey i when i came to uk i thought you know i'm a tier two person because a i'm an immigrant b i'm an immigrant from like russia is sometimes considered a tier two country versus UK. So I didn't know whether there are opportunities or there are not. But what I'm doing now is giving back to the community in terms of mentoring the immigrants, because I still think that it's not a known fact that, you know, you can come and you can be successful and be successful, you know, in whatever part you work in, like I do technology, right, but it can be any other um, industry. And I feel what I see with many, many people, in particular immigrants, is a misconception, you know, will I be good enough? Will I not be good enough? And I'm trying to help them, you know, to try this resilient mindset, but also by sharing some of my obstacles and this makes them feel better, I hope. Yeah, and and I think the and I think and obviously you do this work with them. I think to to you know to see that they have everybody has something unique to offer. Everybody has their own perspective, their own background, their own history. So everybody has something to contribute um, that's unique unique to them, regardless of of what the job is that they do eventually. Uh, I think once you realize that, yeah, I do have something to offer, that changes your perspective somewhat. Yeah. And you need to convince yourself first, as long as you're mm -hmm. convinced, then you can go convince other people. Because I feel the biggest doubt uh, and the biggest obstacle is your own doubt.
you know, you can do it, you can't do it, you're good enough. And sometimes people look for, you know, verification from other people to be like, yes, you can do it. Yes, you have to do it. Yes, you're good at it. And sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. But I think longer term, it's your internal confidence. Yeah, no, 100 percent, because, uh, yeah, you might find some people who'd say you can do it, but you'll probably find a lot of people who will say that you can't do it for their own because of their own internal reasons. Um, therefore, I, again, I, I think you have to be very careful about the people whose advice you uh, you and counsel that you seek. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, listen, Alina, this has been fantastic. Uh, we're just bumping up against the end of our time here. Um, all of Alina's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Oh, yeah, of course. So I'm Alina Timofeva. I am an associate partner in Oliver Wyman, which is a strategy consulting firm like McKinsey. And I recently joined them, but I personally focus on digital transformation, cloud transformation data. I work a lot with financial services, with big brands like HSBC, JP Morgan, consulting them on anything to do with innovation, transformation of digital assets, monetization of digital assets. And I can say that one of the big things for me is growth. Like as an immigrant in UK, I managed to grow quite fast from a graduate to this associate partner in under seven years, which is quite different, I guess, to many of my peers. Mm -hmm. And now I'm spending a lot of time on giving back through mentoring, which is, to be honest, nonprofit for me. Um, but I just care, you know, the females, the immigrants and helping them with the confidence, but also helping them build the path in the UK, in the industry. Yeah, fantastic. Listen, thanks again. This has been a fascinating interview. Thanks again, Alina. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you.